In the past several years, 3D printing technology has grown by leaps and bounds, but in this episode of Retro Access, we ask, is 3D printing retro? Let's find out. <laughs> 3D printing is not necessarily a new technology, it's just that we've heard a lot more about it in recent years. Uh, particularly with the coronavirus pandemic, we saw that there was a lot of talk about people creating masks on their printers and helping people create face shields. Uh, and that was really wonderful stuff. And it's great to see how uh, 3D printing was really made more popular on the mainstream. What we have here is two of the top of the line um, hobbyist printers. These are from Prusa 3D. It's a company in the Czech Republic. And um, I've only had these a few weeks, but I can already tell you that they outperform several other brands that I've tested. I recently had a Creality printer and I had it for several months. It really didn't perform all that well and so I stopped using it. Um, but this is called a 3D Benchy and 3D Benchies uh, are a way which you test the performance of a 3D printer and the reason why this is important is you can see that the, sh the boat itself has different angles and shapes and curves. There's hangovers, areas where uh, you, know, you need to be able to build a structure without supports and this really does demonstrate uh, the capabilities of a printer to, to the maximum. And so running one of these on a new printer really shows you if the printer quality is good and how it measures up to others. So we use these as a benchmark. But printing itself uh, has been around for some time. In fact, there's lots of examples in movies where people have, uh, they've shown 3D printing going back as far as the 1980s and it's a really cool technology. It's been around a long time. And so we're, today we're gonna explore some of the older examples of 3D printing. We'll take a look at some of the processes used in 3D printing and also show you very quickly about how 3D printing can be used to do all kinds of things. So let's take a look. 3D printing's history begins in the 1980s. In 1983, a man named Chuck Hull 3D printed the first ever part and in 1984, his patent for stereolithography apparatus or SLA was approved and he went on to co-found a company called 3D Systems. In 1987, the company created the first SLA-1 commercial 3D printer. In 1988, a similar technology called Selective Laser Sintering, or SLS, which used a directed laser instead of a UV bulb to cure the resin. This same year, the Fused Deposition Modeling, or FDM patent, was submitted by Scott Crump, co-founder of Stratisys. By this time, a new industry was starting, and even Hollywood was taking notice. The 1990 movie Dark Man tells the story of a brilliant scientist left for dead who returns to exact revenge on the people who burned him alive. In order to disguise his identity, he 3D prints faces to change his appearance. The only catch is the printed skin dissolves after a short time. While the 3D printing technology was still in its infancy, the cost of these machines meant that they were for industries and companies with large budgets and very specific use cases. Fast forward to 2004, when Adrian Bowyer introduced the idea of RepRap, a term for replicating rapid prototyper. This was an idea that a machine could replicate itself by printing a copy. Not counting the nuts and bolts, a RepRap printer can make up to 70% of its own parts, with the other parts being easily and cheaply available everywhere else. This kicked off a new wave of 3D printers. By lowering the barrier to entry, new companies were created targeting hobbyists, enthusiasts, and lower cost commercial machines. Brands like MakerBot, Prusa, Lulzbot, and Ultimaker, and many others have now surpassed a decade of successful product development and sales. With hardware also is software. A growing ecosystem of 3D design and slicer software is growing, such as Cura, Slicer, and Idea Maker. Firmware for many machines also share a common open source code base. Here we can see the Marlin firmware found in many printers today with innovations being driven by a community of companies and individuals. Similarly, 3D models are now readily available for download with popular sites such as Thingiverse. So what does any of this have to do with retro computing? 
Now that we've seen a little history of 3D printing, let's talk a bit about what I'm doing today. So uh, I've begun with an idea to reproduce the RetroAxis logo. If you look at the original logo that I had printed, uh, this is one that I had done a, a very long time ago when I got my very first 3D printer. It was a Flash Forge Finder printer. Uh, it was not a great printer, but it did the job, and I was able to make quite a few things you've seen on this show where I've used that printer. Um, but this one was basically a JPEG that I was able to drop onto the slicing software, and it created this really uh, quick you know, 3D version of it, and I was able to you know, put some paints on it. So it's an okay, uh, okay logo, but I'm not terribly happy with it. It's gotten old. So I'm ready for a new one. So what I've done is I've got my software here. I'm using Rhinoceros. This is a, a trial version. I was, I was curious if I, if I would like this software or not. I'm still learning more about it, but it was very quick for me to create uh, the logo. With It had font support and text support. So it's very nice to be able to put this together. So I, I've pasted a new version of the logo here uh, in 3D. I've done a rendering to verify. This is actually a ray traced <laughs> render um, to see what it looks like final. And uh, I, then I moved it from here. I exported it into an STL file and placed it on the slicing software. So the process of creating a 3D uh, print is pretty much have your drawing or your CAD, export your CAD to a format that's supported by your slicer, either an OBJ or an STL file, and then go into the slicer and prepare it to be printed. Now what slicing software does, and this is something I, I thought was interesting, if you think about a 3D object uh, and the way the printer is going to create it, it's going to print it one layer at a time. So what the slicing software does is it actually takes every single layer of that 3D object and defines how it's going to print that layer. Um, and, th and this is important because there might be different temperature settings or if you have a printer that supports multiple filaments where you can print two colors or two different types of material. It needs to know how to intermix those in that layer and, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's, it's a really important piece of, of the puzzle when you're actually doing the 3D print. And this is where I think you should spend the most time. Of course, perfecting your, your object is important too. It has to be correct to print well but I think here is making sure all of your settings are dialed in for a successful 3D print. So there's a lot of trial and error and learning that goes into this. It's a lot of fun. It's a great hobby, uh, much like the old days when we had uh, different types of computers. You know, people actually buy these um, inexpensive 3D printers now and they actually, there's a whole world of people creating mods. So you can actually print mods for your printer and new fans or new, uh, you know, spool holders. There's all kinds of really cool stuff happening. It's a really amazing hobby. So how is 3D printing retro? Well, if you think about back in the day when we had Apple IIs and Commodore 64s and Amigas, and there was all these different types of computers, um, not just the PC or the Mac. Nowadays, it's pretty much you've got a PC or a Mac, and then you've got Windows and Linux. So, so while these ecosystems are, are still large and there's lots of hobbyists involved in each of these, in the old days, it was way more diverse. And I think that's what makes 3D printing so interesting is there is such a diverse amount of vendors who are now coming out and creating new hardware and coming up with new ways to do bed leveling or um, just different types of printers that are coming out. It's just really interesting. I mean, there's things where people are building houses with concrete 3D printers. Just the ideas that are coming out. I mean, it really is an exciting time to be here. You're watching the dawn of a new industry. And I think it resembles quite a bit the way it was back in the 1980s with the personal computers and all the different types of uh, computing companies that were coming out with their ideas. So uh, that's why I think 3D printing is retro. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or if you want to weigh in on whether you think it's retro or not, do so down in the comments below. Give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thanks a lot. Take care of yourself. Mm -hmm.